Alright, so I'm not quite sure how many more problems from this textbook I'm going to do, but for now we have this one, and this one's pretty neat, so let's go through it. It's basically just, it ends up being like a standard, um, well, like it's an induction proof, um, but the way you do it is just a whole bunch of estimates, and I like that, so, anyways... Yeah, so we have a matrix which is strictly column diagonally dominant, meaning that the diagonal term is greater than the sum, the, well, the normal the diagonal term is greater than the sum of all of the other, the sum of the norms of all of the other entries in the columns, and this holds for every single column. So what happens if we do Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting? So... Let's use A1 to denote the matrix that we get after um, the first iteration of this um, algorithm. Because remember, the way that we do um, this Gaussian elimination algorithm is first we switch rows if necessary, and then we um, do some linear combinations in order to delete the entries below the diagonal in the first column and then we move on to the second column and then to the third and then we keep going until we get through the entire matrix so that's how Gaussian elimination works okay so let's consider a1 so a1 in norm is going to be greater than the sum of these because it's um, strictly column diagonally dominant and so this implies that well obviously a11 in norm has to be bigger than all of the other entries in the column in norm. Therefore, no row interchanges will take place in this iteration. Because what we do is at the beginning of the ith iteration is we look through the entries i, i, we look through the i, i through the m, i entries of the matrix and we search for the largest entry and switch that largest entry with the i with the aii entry or with the ii entry so here for the first iteration um aii and norm is going to be the largest one in the column and so you don't make any switches all right so then um let's see here if a1 is the matrix obtained after the first iteration then once we've done the iteration, um, we end up with this matrix here. And these formulas for these terms down here, I've obtained just from the uh, Gaussian elimination algorithm. And you can look that up if you don't remember. Um, but yeah, it'll just look like this. Basically, you, you find for each of these rows, you take L I which is, well, you, you basically take this coefficient here, so like A21 over A11, that's going to be the L coefficient corresponding with this second row here. And then you just subtract that multiple of the first row from the second row. And you do that for every single row. And so you end up with this um, formula. And so we can write this in blocks. So what we're going to do is we're going to break it up like so. Uh, let's see if I can get this to be there. Okay, so we have this A11 in the corner here, then we have A12 to AMM up in this corner, or over here, then all these zeros are going to be here, and then this entire thing is going to be capital B. And what we claim is that B is strictly column diagonally dominant. So if we want to prove this, we have to prove that for every entry on this on the diagonal here, its norm will be greater than the sum of all the other terms on the diagonal. So, mathematically speaking, or symbolically speaking, that means that this inequality must hold. See, this entry here, this is the diagonal term, and then these are the sum of the norms of all the entries above the diagonal and these are the sum this is the sum of the norms of all the entries below the diagonal um, and so of course this sum is going to be an empty sum if b happens to be less than a so for example for i equals 2 
this sum doesn't exist, so it's just this sum, which makes sense because when you look at this entry here, the A22 entry, or the 22 entry of A1, then to check the strictly column diagonally dominant condition, you only look below this term because none of the entries above here belong to the matrix B. And we have a similar thing for I equals M. But anyways, so we want to prove this inequality, and we can actually just prove this directly. So, whoa, that's a lot of estimates. So let's let's walk through this. Okay, so first of all, we have this thing, and this is greater than or equal to this. This is just the reverse triangle inequality. And then from here, this is going to be greater than... Well, AII is going to be, great by assumption, greater than... Um, these two sums because the matrix A is strictly column diagonally dominant. And then we leave this term here. And so then what we can do is we can bring the A1I term out from this sum and we'll put it here. And so now this sum goes from being J equals 2 to I minus 1 instead of J equals 1 to I minus 1. Then we do some algebra here. We factor out the A1I term um, and then we get A11 minus AI1 over here. And then this A11 term, is, since it's in the numerator here, this will, will be strictly greater than this sum. Again, using the um, strictly diagonally dominant condition for the matrix A. And so then what we do is... Okay, so if we write this out... We have AJI, and for J, it, in this sum, J goes from 2 to M. So if we look at all the terms from J equals 2 to I minus 1, then we can pull out an, a, a factor of AJ1 over A11 from here. And then when you factor that out of here, you have to multiply by A1I. So we end up with terms of the form AJ1 over A11 times A1I. And we obtain these terms No. That I should be a 1. There we go. Right, and that makes sense. Because A11 is going to be greater than, we take the sum over all entries in this first column, because A11 is in the first column. Okay, so this is good. Okay, so now for for J equals 2 to I minus 1, we'll pull out an AJI, or an AJ1 over A11 times A1I, and that looks like this. And we have one of them for every single J equals 2 to I minus 1. And still this sum goes from J equals 2 to M, so we can pull out the ones that correspond to j equals i plus 1 through m, and we can put those here. And then the only thing left here in the sum is, well, we didn't pull out the j equals i term. So we leave that there. So we have a1i, no, we have ai1 minus ai1 over a11 here. That's the only thing that's left. But then these things cancel out, and so we're left with 0. And so this term entirely drops out, and all we have left is this sum plus this sum. And then again, we can just use the triangle inequality, because this number plus this this absolute this number in absolute value plus this number in absolute value must be greater than or equal to this minus this entirely in absolute value. All right, that's just a standard triangle inequality. And we apply that here and here. And we notice that what we end up with here is exactly what we have over here. And so we've done a whole bunch of weird estimates and calculations. Well, I guess all we've really done is apply the triangle inequality and use the strictly, the strictly column diagonally dominant condition of the matrix A. But in any case, we attain this inequality. And therefore, B is strictly column diagonally dominant. And that's what we wanted to prove. Well, no.
I guess that's not really what we wanted to prove, but that gets us part of the way there. Okay, so now let's move on to the next matrix. Okay, so, or the, the next iteration. So for the sec second iteration, we begin by pivoting. So like I said before, we pivot row, rows two, we, we switch the second row and the M row So we might pivot some of the rows from 2 through M if necessary. So the way that this works specifically is that rows 2 and I are interchanged only if the I2 entry of A1 is strictly greater in norm than the 2, 2 entry of A1. And this won't happen since B is strictly column diagonally dominant. That's the same argument that we used for proving that um, no switches will take place during the first iteration. And then, at the end of the second iteration, we will have a matrix called A2, and we'll, it can be written as so. So we have these first two rows, which are just things from the first matrix, but then we get zeros all the way down here, so this zero is a column, this zero is a column, and we end up with this matrix C here. And C is an M minus 2 times M minus 2 matrix, and the formula for it will look a lot like this matrix up here. Um, but let's see here. If you saw what I did down there is I started using superscripts to refer to the matrix, um, whether I'm referring to A1 or A2, etc. So basically all these A11, A12, A, M, M, all of these A's up here, these we could actually write as, we could write the superscript as zero because these correspond to the original matrix A, which we could write as A0 if we wanted to. So if we basically, if we took these formulas, but instead of tar starting at two, we started at three. And instead of the superscripts being zeros, they were ones. Then that would give us a formula for the block matrix C that appears in the matrix A2. Okay, so that's how we get this. And then the the last thing is that the argument that allowed us to, to conclude that um, to take the fact that A was strictly column diagonally dominant and prove that B is strictly column diagonally dominant, you do the same argument and you'll be able to prove from the fact that B is strictly column diagonally dominant then therefore C is strictly column diagonally dominant. And yeah, I don't want to go through the details. Basically, we would just take this entire thing, um, but instead of all these ones here, we would have twos, and we would have superscripts of one all over the place, and this sum would start at J equals two, and Let's see here. So then when we come down here, this would go to J equals three and so on and so forth. You can sort of get an idea of what we would have to change in this calculation in order to make it hold for the matrix or for the second step of the iteration. But anyways, what we'll end up concluding is that this block matrix C is strictly column diagonally dominant. And then the fact that C is strictly column diagonally dominant will guarantee that during the third iteration of the algorithm, no row interchanges will take place between rows 3 through M. Okay, so what we end up with here is th this is sort of an inductive argument. Um, so we see that at the end of the ith iteration, the bottom m minus i by m minus i sub matrix of AI will be strictly column diagonally dominant, and this will guarantee that no columns will be interchanged during the i plus one iteration. Therefore, no column interchanges will take place at all throughout the algorithm, and this completes the proof. So I guess one last thing to note here is that this is sort of set up like an induction argument, but it's not written as a super rigorous induction proof. And I did that um, because it would be really tedious to do so. Because basically what we would have to do is we would have to take care of... 
Well, first of all, I guess the base case wouldn't be too hard, but this calculation here, the, I, there would be a lot more variables. So like instead of the ones here, there would be, we'd have to throw in another index and it would, it would be doable. It would just, well, I guess what we could do is we might be able to just replace all the ones with K's and take this sum from J equals K to I minus one, J equals I plus one to M. And then this will go from J equals K plus one, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess it might not be too bad, but the main point is instead of doing like a fully rigorous induction proof, I just wanted to do the calculation for the first step and then show that you can, when, when you're doing all the other iterations of the induction argument, you just change the proof slightly and it still works. So like it's a, it's a valid way of doing an induction argument, um, particularly if you don't want to go through all the especially if you don't want to go through all the work of setting up like a fully rigorous induction argument, particularly when you don't need to in order to convey that the proof works. But anyways, because this, because this estimate works and because you don't have to change much when you repeat this argument for further iterations, we have our induction proof that no row interchanges take place during Gaussian elimination for partial pivoting if we have a strictly column diagonally dominant matrix and therefore we have completed the exercise.